Yeah, I know this is probably weird dropping this smack dab in the middle of the month. I didn't plan for things to turn out this way. I had, I had some grand plans. You see, 15 years ago this month, Disney Channel did some absolutely monumentous. They brought all four corners of the globe together within the course of 29 days. By dubbing this show in at least a dozen languages before launch, they were able to bring this universe to the global stage. They allowed kids from all over the world to experience summer at the exact same time. Even in the dead of American winter, Disney Channel was able to bring the heat by introducing this absolute phenomenon of a show. And I wanted to bring that back. So I sat down to work on it a while ago. I mean, a long while ago. And I plugged away at it for months. But as you can currently see right now, half of the fucking month was gone. I mean, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. I mean, it's, it's, in, it's entirely on me. But I've been working on this for almost a year. I'm not gonna let it entirely slip through. Here's the plan, Jan. Four seasons, four videos. We're gonna go through all of them, probably within a, a weekly structure. Shorter videos are gonna live in between the seasonal uploads. And sometime after we get past season four, I'm just gonna drop a master cut of everything pulled together. We'll get to cover the movies, the spin-offs, yada yada, etc, etc. I had taken the liberty of asking some guests to cover some episodes, so... Whichever ones they cover will be replacing whatever commentary was there previously by me. There's well over a dozen submissions in here. That number might go up over time, but we'll see. I just want to finish the seasons up, man. Every once in a while, I leave in an aside about covering an episode in depth later on. Most of the time, I still pass judgment on them in the moment, but later on, there will probably be extended reviews of them in their own videos. We're just gonna take it slow here. Wow. Here it is, the one that started it all. There's a reason why it was initially pitched as an animatic. With how well paced and well characterized it is, there's a lot that could have gotten lost in the shuffle had this been script driven instead. Mainly visual gags, but there's plenty of good one-liners that could easily be overlooked. I see your point, Candace. No crazy person would scream at a post like that. Visually, it could be considered a bit rough looking. They obviously didn't lock in a specific style of movement yet, so the expressions are more loose and the body language is goofier than you'd expect. I think it works to the pilot's advantage, given that it's easier to emphasize how outlandish this whole setup is. It's very cut and dry, but still gives you enough roughage to surmise basic personalities and motivations. It's got a tight control over its end result without feeling restricted by its structure. There's a lot of thought that goes into breaking down the ideal pilot. There's a lot of directions you could go in, but you only have a limited amount of time to get your point across. Personally, it seems like the best of them can give you a little sampler of a premise's potential rather than a full summary of the story to come. You don't need all your important characters or settings lined up so long as you can establish a definitive vibe and an idea of where you might go in later episodes. If you pick any of Phineas and Ferb's ancestors out of the family line, they accomplished this in spades. SpongeBob? You bet. Rocco? Absolutely. Family Guy? Try it again. I'm Kaka for Cuckoo Puffs. No, damn it, take 26. Well, it's a, it's a bit disjointed, but it gets the job done. It's probably uncanny to watch Roller Coaster in Isolation now because it's well predictive of the first season, while the rest of the show has come so far in every other aspect of production. This and Last Day of Summer aren't exactly two separate series, but they speak to two different eras of TV cartoons, not to mention the show itself. It's a fun, energetic first foray into the vast and ever-present world of Phineas and Ferb. Sunscreen listeners, because tomorrow's weather calls for another scorcher. With a slight chance of scattered lawn gnomes. <laughs> 
This one is solid on both ends. Perhaps a bit more self-contained, but still carries a lot of energy to it. It's giving theatricals short before the main feature vibes. My favorite scene has to be the surfing contest. It's just chock full of great gags. This will be said a lot over the course of the next six, seven hours. I apologize in advance. It's fascinating to see the show place Candace in a more favorable situation without much of a reference point for what they'd be subverting. Thus far, we got two regular stories where she attempts to get her bust on, and one where she's motivated mainly by pride and self-satisfaction. This time, she starts out in search of the bust, but finds much greener pastures ahead. She's along for the ride, but she's aware of what she's in for. Even so early on, it's nice to see her cherish the little things. She's not beside herself or anything, but you can tell she was appreciative. This one also marked the debut of a top 20 hit for this franchise. Give it up for Backyard Beach. Listen up, people and I'll teach ya. Stop it. It's funny because this was quite a bit of time before they started pulling out songs with the true lyrical prowess. Production-wise, this one sits a few episodes behind Flop Stars, the one that solidified the song in every episode rule. But even then, the song that pushed that into motion was written to sound as stupid as possible. A lot of the earlier tracks are closer to little ditties and jingles than anything else. That doesn't make them bad, but it can be a surprising subversion when the main song featured can be overshadowed by an actual 10 second ditty. Well, we wake up early and wax our surfboards down. We'll hit the beach, yeah, we'll hit the beach. I like Backyard Beach all the same, but I keep coming back to that other track. This is just a really nice vibe. I don't think we've heard enough of it in this series. In Reciprocal, Doof's subplot is a little less pertinent, but still iconic all the same. As far as his crackpot schemes go, I would argue this is probably more down to earth. I mean, his commentary makes it a lock. Come on. And thus, the long affair with garden gnomes is officially kicked off. Overall, a relatively chill time with the boys. In some way, I feel like this is the most idyllic or at least simplistic version of this concept. I reckon it would have worked well even as another version of the pilot. It's a feel-good adventure that can still account for ample laughs. A one-hit wonder. Verb, I know what we're gonna do today. I want you to think through the basis of this premise. These kids are sitting at the breakfast table, and one of them posits that international stardom and explosive fame is on par with a typical pencil-pushing affair. In his mind, there's no creative way to stretch the legs, and after a while, the job would become creative purgatory. Normally, it'd just be a beat where we remember that Phineas and Ferb are kind of tiny adults and just move on. Except they're not. Especially not at this point. They don't even know what a one-hit wonder is. Their task to follow such a career on an accelerated track is a fascinating endeavor. It doesn't even feel like something they thought would be fun. <laughs> Mainly because they said it wouldn't be. This was more in the vein of a social experiment. They still smashed their goals, but this one was definitely more experimental for them. Structurally, it reminds me a bit of Spongebob's Idiot Box. It's one of those joints where the quirky savants unwittingly master a skill that their foil can only dream to. I don't remember much about Deuce's plan other than the robot skyscraper and this banger of a line. <gasps> Perry the Platypus! You're a temp? Are times that hard? This is the first time where I'd say he felt like a non-entity to me. But relative to everything else, it's kind of low-key. It's kind of a vibe. This is the first episode that I would really characterize as Phineas and Ferb versus the world. There's an episode that introduces a skill or a hobby the boys latch onto, and without any real experience, you crush the competition without breaking a sweat. There's plenty of them in season one and more spread out throughout the additional three, but if I had to venture a guess, they're really in their prime here. There's a giant NASCAR race happening like a hundred yards behind his house, and this kid's one impulse is just to join in on the fun. Seeing the team slowly climb their way to the top is actually a sight to behold. The animation quality definitely tightened from the first two episodes, which comes at a significant benefit, considering that this is the first real song that they do. Yeah, yeah, it's a montage track, but it, it definitely hits different. 
There's a crazy amount of energy from Candace's side too. Gifted us this immaculate moment right here. Brilliant! Hey, Candace is rooting for us. Candace, you're on the big screen. Candace! She goes above and beyond to get the bus started. It's wild. This is likely the first time she's technically succeeded. Meanwhile, Doofenshmirtz is aiming to monopolize the careful art of inflation. Pause. What the fuck? His plan is actually kind of grounded, even if the way he chooses to describe it is nuts. The resolution of the last minute high-speed chase is pretty satisfying to watch. The whole episode is firing on all cylinders here. Enjoy while it lasts, Candace. Fame is fleeting. But the internet is forever. <sighs> Good night, Candace. This episode introduces the possibility of Phineas and Ferb becoming internet overlords, a probability that was never played with beyond this story. They had a foothold in early internet age content creation. In theory, they could have been the next Green Brothers. We already knew they were ruthless businessmen, but I do have to wonder what figure they were offered to work on this specific project. Look, my client gets 3% of the gross and a piece of the back end or he walks. Yeah, that's right. You mess with the bull, you get the horns, buddy. It's interesting to see their dynamic spelled out a bit more transparently. It's clear that Phineas is the idea guy while Ferb tightens things up behind him. I'm sure that sounds obvious, but it's not acknowledged as much by the show itself. At times, they're kind of treated like a hive mind or something. I would hesitate to give it props for good gags, because it's less gags and more abject chaos than I'm looking at. The editing room one was immaculate, though. Wouldn't change it for the world. Doof wasn't even out for scalps this time. He just he just wanted to become a casual cheesemonger. And Perry forced his hand and unleashed a true reckoning upon this mortal realm. This one isn't boring or anything, but it's definitely on the softer side. If anything, it feels more generic in execution. This could have been a Brandy and Mr. Whiskers episode for all we know. When are they gonna reboot that? I, I, would, I would love to see that actually. Sharks have to continue to move forward. Or they'll drown. You calling me a shark? This one is just funny. It's good that it keeps up with itself, but this whole scenario is, is whack. This gradual descent into madness is as casual as it gets. Phineas is just riding this insanity like it's not even happening. I doubt this would have changed his tune any, but Holyfield is a straight up content demon for <laughs> giving this child an incredible amount of false hope. Buford went through a whole character arc here. It seems like an aggressively good introduction to an identity we don't even get to really see past season one. Late stage Buford could decimate this guy. I really like how this one looks. Apparently, Kent Osborne was one of the storyboard artists on it, and it does show. He gave everyone these bigger highlights on the eyes, and it does affect the feel a little bit, especially during the match. I like how intense everything looks. The benefit of being an early episode being as clear as day here. If you couldn't do with looser, slightly off-model keys and such, it wouldn't be communicated as well. The way that they chose to break Phineas's model is really great. Didn't have to be super over the top, but in the context of everything, it looks goofy as hell, and I love it. It structures quite a bit of gravitas in the general story, but it still revels in its absurdity and plays to its strengths. It's a really fun one. Did you like your birthday present? <laughs> well, it was definitely better than the gorilla in the cake. If for some reason you felt like the pilot was lacking characteristically, then consider this one the actual first episode. You're welcome. As you can see, Phineas has not exactly lost his edge yet. It's the first one with Lawrence, and it's also the first one that gets you invested in this deep lore and expansive world building. Candace. Her name was seven letters. Candace. Only wears designer sweaters. Candace. She's got an allergy to dairy. They would go on to contradict this exact statement in roughly ten episodes. In any event, this episode feels a bit low key compared to Roller Coaster. Most of the hard action elements shift over to Perry's B-plot, where him and Doofenshmirtz spend a good chunk of time tunneling through mountains. The boys are solely consumed with putting together this lavish birthday present. It's interesting because up until the big reveal, Candace is more dismissive than anything. Like in season one, she's definitely more of a traditional sitcom level older sister. 
but she has moments where she's more vicious than the show would normally treat her. Anyway, the duality of Candace probably gives her a bit more depth than you'd be looking for. Witnessing her bounce from stunned silence to weepy admiration to excited bustability is fascinating. She's actually really proud of the gift that they made. Busting them is more about showing off this, this thing that they made for her. It's really nice. Really solid follow-up to a really fun pilot. Phineas and Ferb? Phineas? Ferb? Furbius? Phineas? Ferb? They're my brothers and they're robots! They're robots! Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! This one was interesting more on a theoretical level. It's actually kind of heady once you think about it. The whole conceit of this show is that these two are doing insanely complicated shit in their backyard, but philosophically they are stumbling around in the dark. They're only governed by their own personal goals and limits most of the time. This one, it made these two learn a lesson. They didn't slip out of arrogance or anything, it just, they just didn't think about the ramifications of what they were doing. They just figured some robot servants were the right course of action here. They were playing God, and God struck back. In some ways, the boys' experiments turn out to be more fruitful than the straightforward voyages. Obviously, if you know this show, you know that very few of these episodes are portrayed in a linear order. These are taking place all over the course of one theoretical summer, though really it could be more at this point. But it is serendipitous that this one was produced and premiered before the first time that they decide to do nothing. It helps demonstrate the perspective that they've taken on in such short order. Their exploits are still fairly innocent, but there's a bit more weight to making the most of it after a few of these. Doof actually looks like a, a bit of a nut here. I know that this sounds oxymoronic, but there's some, something about a magnet, voicemail, Santa, doesn't, doesn't really add up, dude. It's a decent one. I can feel the character focus in this one, and it's a welcome change of pace. Well, just remember, Gaston said I'll always be his coup de crayon. You do realize that that's French for pencil neck. The fact that the boys just retrofitted their drip to fit slightly realistic adult proportions is nothing short of hilarious. Everyone looks like background dancers and it's very hard to unsee. They tried art and they did reproduction instead. I do think the way the two storylines merged was really clever. I also think milking the clone B plot for a little longer would have killed. But overall, pretty solid. All right, get in the car, snappy pants. What was that about? I reckon herding cattle ain't for city folk. I don't hear many people mention this one. To me, it seems like a solid avenue to introduce the idea of this show. It's another one of those where the kids are thrown into a completely out of hand situation and they just have fun with things while they unknowingly fix everything. I guess the expedition itself is a little more vanilla than they tend to be but it's still pretty good shit. The imagery of herding steer through a buffet table is just peak. This one is built from the ground up to handle the mother load of visual gags, which I think it succeeds at, though it's clearly not on everyone's radar. The pacing of it reminds me of the chariot race, which we are relatively far away from discussing. In contrast, it's one of those episodes where Doof is attempting to force the hand of the tri-state rather than taking said hand by force. I guess it's less absurd than normal. I actually find the lava pit to be a little too elementary for him. Like deceptively easy for Perry to get out of. What's he planning? I like it. It's not a top 10, but it's a bit underappreciated for how early it came out. Hey Phineas. Hi Isabella. What you doing? We're making Swinter. Swinter? It's a unique and logic defying amalgam of winter and summer. They should have sold the patent for that modified snow cone machine. It would have made an absolute killing. The Meltinator had the capacity to actually engage in genuinely evil activities, but its only purpose was to melt chocolate. It's interesting to see Doof treat their routine as something more. Might be the first time he was written like that. Like we know how much it means to him later down the line, but here it's like he's still trying to play it cool. That snowboarding sequence was the scene that launched a thousand toy designs. I tend to appreciate its composition a lot more, personally. This is one of the episodes handled by Sherm Cohen, one of the greats from the Spongebob production staff. The boards for this one in particular are pretty appealing. Hey everybody! Over here! Wait, 
how'd he get down there? And perhaps Buford truly is amazing. It's one of those episodes that, while completely serviceable on its own, easily outranked and outmatched by most of the episodes before and after. Not even episodes that couch some of the greatest songs are immune from this. Ever since I started working on this thing, I've been bumping Evil Boys probably, probably once a week at the very least. It's the only reason why I remember this episode in, in the first place. Other than the climax, that, that, that's also pretty good. Otherwise, it's it's totally fine. You know, mummies have their brains pulled out of their nose. <sighs> the lucky ones. I think it's important to give episodes like these their dues when they don't play into the whole the same thing happens bit. Thematically, I think season one stuck to the mandate of making summer last pretty well. I could imagine people who don't really know Phineas and Ferb as a concept assuming that these characters are only fulfilled by building their way to the top. In actuality, a lot of their greatest adventures involve them scaling up conventional kid stuff, so it makes those occasions where they keep things small a little more intriguing. I don't think I was expecting this joint to be as action-oriented as it is. Not that I'm complaining. <laughs> the rougher visuals really help embellish the madcap chaos that's unfolding. It's not James Baxter tier movement design or anything, but because the character acting is so on point, the moments spent on the run are timed to the nines and ruthlessly funny. When the episode isn't busy sneaking in the next background gag, our main characters are dropping some heavy bars. Wow, I didn't expect them to be so scary. I mean, can you imagine the angry, twisted soul hidden under those bandages? <laughs> Makes me shudder. The boys kind of went on a, a mini-arc with this mummy that did not exist. They went through the stages of grief just trying to find this thing. There's nothing presented that would point them to the movie theater basement, but they just ended up there. They just assumed that they would bag a mummy because they wanted to. Breaking the status quo without establishing it yet. I dig it. Looks like we're gonna be secret agents, huh? When did you find the time to build all this, fur? Actually, I... If you don't remember this one very well, you're not crazy. This one got Thanos snapped out of rotation after like a year or so. It premiered during the very first February, and it got a good amount of airtime in before it officially got pulled. There was already an actual band with the same name, and they wanted their bread. I think the, the next time it dropped, it was a few weeks before the season 4 finale. But even at this point, it's not super common to see it in reruns. Seemingly, this is the first real episode to focus on Candace and Stacy's relationship. Quite a few of their episodes later on is just about the former learning to not push the ladder to the side. Here is just an episode where they're vibing against a, a common enemy, if you will. It's obvious that Candace is more outspoken out of the two, but this is really that first time where she gets to use it to her abject benefit. Good lesson. I don't really think that Betty's got anything out of it, but, you know, they were contractually obligated to write a song with them. It's only really about them learning to care because they believe that one of these girls single-handedly saved their lives. Of course, this was mainly attributed to the boys hijacking super secret spy gear and managing to catch their tour bus in time, but they, they don't need to know that. Perry kind of helped too. They have no idea. Alka takes another L, letting these two boys sneak into a top secret lair. Personally, uh, you know, the episode itself is okay, but they did fumble in another area that's loosely related. Laser beam, magnet ray, cup holder, you really thought of everything, Ferb. Actually, hold that thought. It doesn't come up super often, but they did have more of a habit of ignoring Ferb this season. Gets tossed around or punted. <laughs> at certain points, and uh, I don't like it. I don't like it. This man doesn't speak that much anyway. Why do you Why do you feel the need to interrupt him? There's a fair amount of episodes where he doesn't even speak at all. So watching him progressively get ignored is just, is just rough. This is probably the most egregious example out of all of them. So it, it kind of balances out the negatives of its disappearance. I kind of understand it now. Hey, how's it going? Hey, Ferb, snap out of it. What happened back there? I was weak. 
This one's slower paced, but the comedy, especially while more character focused, is pretty solid. The type of gags you know earns the show its reputation for being wordy, but doesn't take away from the story itself. The gags put in during the billboard monologue are pretty choice. It functions as a more well-rounded introduction to Vanessa than her actual debut in The Magnificent Few. I truly feel ashamed for not recognizing this as the episode that gave us busted until like maybe 30 seconds before. Truly, life would not be the same. Bonus points for bringing back Snarky Phineas. Who, 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 who could turn him down? Say, aren't you a little... Young to be using titanium plating and an industrial arc welder? Yes, yes I am. It's fun. Now who would buy a brick for a toy? It does absolutely nothing. Easily one of the most iconic builds of the first season. Two elementary school children teaching a boardroom of executives about free space theory? That, that, that's the one. This is probably one of their most heavily inspired ideas in a general sense. It's not uncommon for them to see something on TV and completely transform that into something different. Here it's just a clear pastiche. There's a, a lot to say about this factory. I'm gonna assume that everybody got benefits and just move on with my life. That fake out with Agent P in the warehouse was tough. It still has the impact. It comes at you so fast. The same can't necessarily be said for the scene near the river, but it does make some implications about... You know what? I'm gonna let you decide that one, because there's a few answers to that. Put it there! 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 Put it there. <laughs> Still a man of few words, I see! Well, actually... So, I... where's your sister? I think this is the first episode that is down to earth enough to be considered imitable. I kind of started paying attention to it after I rewatched Raging Bully, and they gave us the SMP line. Okay, boys, let's have a fair and square fight, and in no way should this ensuing fight contain the image of a potentially harmful, hurtful, or psychologically disturbing physical act that could be found imitatable by an impressionable child viewer. Ugh. Aside from the snow cone machine, this is one of the few times where the kids at home could likely follow along if they wanted to. Kind of surprised Disney didn't do anything with that. This is like three miniseries in one. All the season one grandparent joints are wholesome and energetic. It's a pretty good time. Though the advent of seeing Doof blown out the airlock by Perry's mere presence on a date, that's, that's rough. She's a tire spinning, gear grinding, clutch burning, backfiring, paint trading, redlining, overheating, throttle stomping, truck driving girl. Listen, any episode that features Lawrence is already on the right track. Obviously the monster truck is kind of the star of the show, but it's funny how fast he gets into the swing of things. His kids gave him a real edge in a matter of minutes. Dad, you look nervous. No, of course not. I, I have full confidence in you. Candace, those dudes need to suck our mud. That debriefing is kind of ominous to watch in current year. Not necessarily even because his nickname is used more than his actual name, but because the doof would go on to overshadow like 95% of the characters. He's just that good. It's wild to think that Heinz could have had a career building monster trucks or something. He does not respect the craft, but he is damn good at it. Okay, let me call you back. Yeah, we're inside Candace's stomach. That's creepy on so many levels. Ah, it's a little bit bland. Hemoglobin Highway is chill, but as, as far as fantastic voyage plots go, didn't give me much beyond what they normally do. Personally, I think the end credit gag is unskippable, but maybe that's just me. Hmm, it just occurred to me that I may have misspelled Time Machine on the plans. Well, I hope that's not going to be an issue. <laughs> Apparently not. In broadcast order, this one is actually the first half-hour special for the show. In terms of lore and character building, this one's a pretty big deal. Though it's not as self-directed as some of the other episodes in the season, it does give us a bit of a deeper glimpse into how these guys all bounce off of each other. It's probably one of the better dissections of the intersecting roles of everyone, even if it was a basic peek behind the curtain. I don't know if you, you noticed, but comedically, this show was edgy. Like, dark edgy. Two minutes in, they came out swinging with a joke about the boy's dead dog. I just... I, I can't. They were definitely leaning into uh, the sitcom-style snark, 
but it definitely takes on a different tone. It's not as hyper or fast paced as some of the episodes before it, but it's very broad in what it decides to do, which helps with the A plot, which is predisposed to provoking Candace on a tremendous scale. The B plot featuring the other Asian P is a decent deconstruction in how both parties treat the relationship. Again, we're not too far in yet, so we haven't gotten to see a pair beyond the stoic, hyper-competent version of him that we were all spoon-fed initially. Establishing Peter as this fling that doesn't even take this thing seriously adds a whole level and nuance to what we're doing here. We're not at a point where Doof is a real partner to Perry, but it's clear that they think the same way when it comes to Nemesis ship. Nemesis ship? Nemesis? Doesn't really matter. They get to develop throughout the rest of the show, but the story gives a good baseline of their core values. They grow as people, and they still maintain their basic obligation to each other. The other dynamics shown here are much quieter in practice, but still a joy to watch. Lawrence didn't really even have any jokes, but he was great on screen. The kids all had plenty of good one-liners. Fireside Girls got to shine here. Time Machine. Just Time Machine. It's well-paced and well-constructed. Even without knowing much about Phineas and Ferb yet, we got a pretty tight half-hour adventure to reflect on. Well, don't just stand there. Kiss her! Come on. Come on. Who are we fooling here? This one is a classic. This is like peak for season one. I don't really think I can tap into it well without just giving it its own video. It almost doesn't get any better than this. Honestly, I think Ink Out Rhythm by itself could sustain a pretty decent analysis. The needle drop video is gonna, it's gonna change the world. You'll see. Fun never falls too far from the treehouse. In contrast to its paired up segment, this one is even more wholesome. It's funny because in contrast to that one, Candace is a lot less hot under the collar. Mindless pranks are a no-go, but treehouse robots that rampage downtown, totally fine. But real talk, I, I do like that they allow her to have fun here. No real stakes or anything, it's just the four of them having giant Voltron paddles in the middle of the city. I would also have to commend Heinz because this, this plan is actually kind of smart to be honest. You may think it's petty, but this probably gets him closer to taking over the tri-state area than you would think. Overall, it's a pretty good time. First time out as pirates and we come home with a bounty of beards. And perhaps the greatest pirate story ever told. Really energetic joint, it pretty much never stops moving. By technicality, this makes Candace the only member of the family to have seen, and in theory, remembered seeing Agent P in action. Useless trivia, but it's still funny. The namesake for the episode is kind of underrated as far as season one bops go. I mean, everyone got a line in this one. Look at Ferb. Look at him go. Not the ideal image of a Phineas and Ferb adventure, but it carries the exact same energy that makes it one. Don't look at me! Ah! I'm a monster! Ah! Make it stop! Ah! It's okay, Ferb. She's gone. You can look now. No. Not taking any chances. As far as raw action elements go, this one stands out. Baljeet always had that dog in him, you never should have doubted him. <laughs> that is right! It sparks my opponents! Sir, do you smell something burning? It's crazy how strong an introduction we got to Norm. You would totally expect him to just start off as, a, as an incidental and then move on up. Nah, he was always styling. He was stunting on him from the jump. The race is obviously at the center of the episode, and that's totally fine. It's a thoroughly entertaining watch through and through. Why don't you come in for snacks? Why don't you come in for some snacks? Oh, there you are, Perry. Oh, there you are, Perry. And Ferb says... You know gladiators were Roman, not Greek. It's nice to see Candace bounce off of someone that doesn't write her off immediately. The insanity of this woman's media career hinging on scooping this family in particular just hurts. You know that she'd have so much material to work with, but she will never get to present her findings. I'm cringing, it's, it's painful. I mean, she seems like an okay person. I, I, I want her to succeed. I've always wanted this as a full track. It's a minor motif and it shows up in later episodes, but it's not utilized that much. It's a great early track, 
in a memorable episode, I would say. Glad you like the card, Mom. It's a simple postmodern fusion of origami and pop-up. Yeah, and just wait till you see your present. Another good Candace episode right off the bat. This girl is overlooked and undermined by her mom like every day. Yet she still pulls out all stops to give her a decent birthday gift. You can slowly see her unravel each time the boys top her, but she presses on, undeterred. The song itself is beautiful, though within the wider context of the show, it kind of takes on a different meaning for me. I have no doubt that this woman loves her three freak children, but she does kind of treat Candace like shit. In a situation where her party would normally constitute a straight up bust, the lack of resentment is astounding. This is another one partially handled by Osborne, but I feel like a lot of the characterization here is indicative of his partner's input, Aliki Theophilopoulos. If there is a killer Candace episode in the future, 10 to 1 is going to have Aliki's name on it. There's a few female storyboard artists that are credited with fleshing out Candace in particular, and you can really see her start to be humanized here. You get to see the development firsthand. It's going to be awesome, I'm telling you. Hey, what's this thing do? Hey guys, Candace around? Good catch, Jeremy. I wouldn't outright say that this one's unnotable, but it's definitely one of the more settled adventures on this wild ride. I like those episodes where the boys take the reins of pre-established lore and such. This granny discourse is pretty good in and of itself, though. Pretty low-key. Oh, there you are, Perry. Wow, boy. And with handsome movie actor Vance Ward. He seems much faster on TV. Pretty chill, all things considered. Chronologically, this must have been an earlier day. Candace is instigating way too hard. Candace? Who's having fun now? It's like boredom's a bad rash and I'm a shot of cortisol! That sequence with the ugly nader is by far one of the funniest collection of gags they have ever put forth. This one's memorable mainly for the vibe. The end credits are easily the most satisfying part of the whole thing. Well, I guess we can't compete with a sandwich like that. They say if you love something, let it go. Especially if it's a caveman. This one kind of just lets stuff happen, and I'm very much okay with that. I'm kind of surprised that this one might not be as well-liked crew side. I remember it being pretty funny. Taking care of the caveman makes Phineas and Ferb look a bit innocent, but the chaotic energy that embodies such a task should not be ignored. He's not a lost puppy, he's a 30,000 year old cro magnet. He's Kong. It's interesting that they had a bit more of a dynamic with him compared to the imaginary mummy, but the conceit of the episode is still just watching him conk shit up. There's more of an emphasis on the story, but uh, this one and the mummy one are, are jam-packed with excellent gags. I guess the ones here aren't as well orchestrated, but I still laughed a lot, even without a strong reason to. In some way, it bends the formula for the culture by just ending things where they are. It's serviceable, but of course there are episodes before it that set the bar pretty high. I can't believe how fast we put this together. Yes, it usually takes us at least a montage. Personally, I find the goldfish are quite fascinating. This man relied on an Oscar bait backstory to justify his pure anguish. He's bare in his soul, and it's not like he, he expects to be helped or anything. He's just recounting his life story. And the response he gets is kind of insane. What? Wow, this is more annoying than when he was bullying us. We gotta do something to get the old Buford back. Maybe we should help him find his fish. How many noogies can one bully dole out to make you that spiteful? He's so mean, he's so callous to him. In his time of need, I don't understand. Watching Doof deal with making an accidental leap from the dark side was pretty interesting. I found it fascinating. He tried to do damage control instead of just doing something more evil to counterbalance it that seems more in line with his personality. He was the original Dan Versus. He can resent anything and everything in record time. I hear there's a new version of Jane Eyre in the offing. I'm gonna refer back to my thoughts on the Bigfoot one. In premise and in mood, these two are peas in a pod. It's a bit harder to replicate in real life, but still entirely possible. I wonder why these weren't paired up instead. 
That joust is pretty good, but I am partial to that BBC gag. Ferb, where are you going? Ferb? What did I miss? Huh? This episode is all about family matters. It's one of the few times we get to see Perry acknowledge his host family as something more. It's also one of the few times Alka actually came through for this man. When they initiated that special disposal procedure, Perry only looked mildly bewildered, which is how I can tell this was early on in the show's lifespan. It's a consistent enough fact that the first season had the edgier, darker sense of humor. That scene on the bridge is funnier than it's supposed to be. See, these three kids hauled ass to catch up to Norm and put their own lives on the line to do it. And while the resolution, as wholesome as it may be, does technically shake out, it certainly kind of paints Candace in a different light. She just she just took way too long to make a decision here. I mean, I mean, watch watch this whole thing closer. It takes Phineas about four seconds to grab this disc. It takes her at least 12 to figure out whether or not to save him. It's kind of poetic in a way. But framing this as like a, a, a magical moment is a little unhinged to me. She took so long. She could have probably had both if if she wasn't stuck thinking about this for as long as she was. It's almost like he was the consolation prize or something. I, I, I just don't get it. But in all seriousness, it's a very notable episode with a relatively wholesome image. Our first entry is for the world's largest bowling ball and the others for the world's largest game of pinball. Wow, well, let's see them. Wait for it. I do like the premise. But after the initial pinball sequence, uh, eh, I'm, I'm kind of good. Entrepreneurial doof tends to come up with more evil schemes and I am, I am living for it. Everything wraps up pretty well, but not in the same place it normally does. When the episode ends, it's just kind of the end of that episode, but not the story. It's nicer to see those looser elements thrown in on occasion. I guess you were right. Girls are just as good as boys. Thanks again. Woohoo! GF Games Rock. That was completely out of character. This is one of only two times that Phineas and Ferb has attempted to pull off this stock subplot. It is the only time that they kind of got it right. I feel like they should have tried to pit Isabelle and Buford against each other more. So while it is evident that she would best him 98% of the time, they still have like a decent competition going on. It actually kind of reminds me of adulting a little bit, but this one feels more organic. It's fascinating to see Heinz at work when it comes to family stuff. Eventually, he comes to distinguish himself and revel in his unique sensibilities. But before, he was just trying to replicate all the things that maligned him back at home. It's kind of sad, but it, it makes his transformation all the more sweet. When I'm 88, you will be so busted. Actually, you'd be 88 and a half. Whatever! Yeah, I didn't have much to say about this one. I didn't remember much of what stuck out to me after I watched it. The episode is notable for being the birthplace of this icon. It's fun to revisit these and refresh yourself on the full context of each song's existence. Like, this one's just a manifestation of, like, some three-year-old's wrath. Look at that swing! gets a point for that, of course. It birthed one of the great legends. Other than that, it's kind of outranked by others in the season. It, it's it's a fine episode. It's just, you know, it's it's okay. I still don't know how we ended up at Little Duffer's. I don't know why we didn't build it here in the first place. Oh, there you are, Perry. This is Stacy's first feature, right? I mean, even if it wasn't, it definitely elevated her to the coolness. Most of the episode is just her on the green and it did a great job of establishing her personality, seeing her try to carry out the bus single-handedly and slowly get lost in the chaos's peak. I want to steal Doof's house in the suburbs. I have to assume he got the same amount of alimony all throughout, but it seems like he was just doing a bit better early on. All this extra real estate does not come cheap. I kind of feel him with his take on suburban life. If anything, living there would bring the utmost evil out of him. You guys are so busted! I'm telling Mom! You might consider bathing first. For a body swap episode, it's pretty tight. The premise is just one of the several side dishes that have to make up the tapestry of an episode. On paper, this one is notable, 
but it's a bit more pulled back than you think. I have a hard time remembering golden moments and such. I think it is sacrilegious to skip the end credits, though. When I wasn't so long in the tooth, I had some grand larks and engaged in a fair amount of daring do. Translate? When he was younger, he did a bunch of stuff. A feel-good joint through and through. Not too notable visually, but the heart of the series leaps out here. There are barely any stories with either set of grandparents past season one, but the ones that they gave us here are just great. Having been paired up with Betty's, this one was excluded from syndication as well, but it seems like in current year it has the potential to make itself more well known to the wider fan base. That was a great day, Ferb. What did you think the scariest thing was? Definitely the giant floating baby head. I remember this one as the episode that drew me into the show. Definitely not my first episode, just the one that really got me invested in this world and these characters. The three-way focus on character conflict was a nice sample platter of what's to come, especially considering its position smack dab in the middle of the season. It gives you everything that you could want. You got the action, you've got the impressive build, you've got the song, you've got the Candace conflict. You even got a little bit of ship tease thrown in there for fun. What more could you honestly ask for? We're gonna have to, we're gonna have to spend a little more time on this one later. Platypus monsters are the only monsters to lay eggs. Now this one is a favorite. This was the original time skip episode. It's comfy how close to home it sticks. It barely feels like a subversion. And might I say, these performances are just immaculate. It's alive! Alive! <laughs> and it's really big. Episodes like these aren't anything new in animation, but I think this one has a bit more charm than they normally do. But look at how happy he is. Look at him. I guess you kind of could consider it filler, but it would be an absolute waste to skip this one over. There's no higher place of honor than the fridge. Especially a giant fridge. So a good chunk of my rewatch was spent watching it within a group. We combed through some of the most iconic moments, ones that hooked us in, reeled us in as kids. But for all the time that we spent together, the one consistent draw for everyone was the recurrence of Django. He is the hidden Mickey of this franchise. It's not really about where he's hidden, it's about when. We find him next. You probably already know his dad is a famous artist who's perpetually busy, and his son wants to impress him with his own artistic prowess, but his dad's barely around to give him a shot. So Phineas and Ferb decide to help him. They want to paint the desert, assuming that using the dunes as a canvas would make his work way too big to ignore. So they put everything into this. Uh, Phineas improved his penmanship just for this. It's like a night and day difference. It makes it even worse considering how it was destroyed, being washed away by a flood. Luckily, the original reference image was saved, but his dad really only put that shit up on the fridge, which I don't think he felt any way about it, but I certainly did. Doofenshmirtz is in similar form here, preparing for a visit from his old mentor in evil. Spoiler alert, things didn't really work out as planned. It's definitely far from the only one, but I do have to say that Impressed My Professor was robbed of many props. You can start to see a deeper reliance on Perry start to build. In the context of the story, he's kind of the consolation prize for not being validated for his attempts at evil. And Perry is the one link that confirms his baseline status as an evil scientist. You can't beat an ending like this. The crowd loves you! But they're booing and hissing. Of course they're booing and hissing. You're the villain, right, Ferb? A hero is a hero, but everybody loves a great villain. This one has the sheen of SpongeBob shining right off of it. There's a fair amount of tight details in the gags that give the premise some extra heft. Like, it's, it's all jokes, but this episode's an unironic period piece for animation in the mid-2000s. The kids are copying trends and shit from the time. They were inspired to build their animation studio off of a Pee Wee Herman XP, and yet the final product ended up being some weird Totally Spies Power Rangers type hybrid, which by the way, has aged even better after we all discovered that Dan and Swampy contributed to the Americanized Sailor Moon pitch. It all comes together. The Doof and Periarch felt a bit barren here, 
most of the energy is definitely coming from the other side, but I have no complaints. It's always entertaining. Phineas is way too into the idea of letting the computers build the cartoon for him. If only things were that simple. He doesn't know how bad it is out in these streets. The first time that I, I, I wrote this one out, New Deal for Animation was still in play. And then uh, it wasn't. So I kind of took it out. But I think at this point, it's it's still relevant. So <laughs> I'm, I'm adding it back in for posterity. Yeah, it felt pretty short, but it was a good time. A solid standard for the tail end of season one. You know, in retrospect, I question the inclusion of a self-destruct button in the first place. It's much easier for me to pick out certain cues in a size that I liked more so than the course of the story itself. It cribs entirely off of typical convention being flipped on its head. It's a humorous idea, but probably not as funny as its peers. Like, it utilizes funny ideas to fuel it. But I think a lot of those pregnant pauses just takes me out of it. What's keeping him? Gee, I, I hope something horrible happened to him. Does someone need a hug? What I'm saying is it's not unhinged enough for my taste. It's actually pretty relaxed for a season one joint. Can't you guys just find some old nuts and bolts lying around? And Jerry rig up some kind of machiny dealy bob and get us out of this situation? Candace, we are just kids. Pretty decent, though out of all the special featured so far, this one felt like the least memorable to me. Fun once you get into it, but bits and pieces of it kind of blend together. Phineas and Fur build rockets like Disney gives some extra seasons. This is the most vanilla one of the whole pack, but the montage of them building it is killer. It destroys me every single time. One of the things that makes it feel bigger is Candace's arc regarding this dance and learning how to navigate this ship. The exchange with the two-headed alien is pretty choice. Giving Isabella that similar conflict was also interesting. Again, not super memorable to me, but it was a decent time. Oh, I almost forgot! Perry was in the dream too! He was like a super secret agent or something! Perhaps that's where he disappears to every day. Spoiler alert. I think the context of this one being a dream within a dream does take some of the bite out of the story, but it also paints Perry in a much more compelling light. Though it's a bit idealistic, he has an extremely believable, if not outright accurate take on his family and how they present in this imaginary circumstance. I could see it having a lot more gravitas when it premiered, because the events presented are, are still pretty intense, but in comparison to later, darker works, I don't think it has as much long-standing power, thematically speaking. I found it interesting how the early show was content to hit us over the head with anti-creativity Aesop's. It's not a bad element. It just feels a bit out of line with the show's wider personality. Otherwise, very strong, dramatic piece from the earliest days of the show. I just can't believe you guys built a portal to Mars and didn't go through it yourselves. Oh, we did, but that's another story. So realistically speaking, I would much rather cover both parts as one whole, but I ended up actually putting one part over the other in the ranking and that, that just didn't make much sense. So two parts it is. This one is a, a decent setup. You know, you've got a compelling story here from the jump. I was expecting a, a cameo from the Baljeet signal going in, but, but then I realized that that's like a, that's like a few episodes away. On a technical level, Bollywood is solid as hell, but I do not know how to feel about it otherwise. I'm not saying anything, I'm just, I'm just putting it out there. The whole concept of this man constantly being whipped by a baking soda volcano will never not be hilarious. I think it really speaks to the, the futility of man and the totality of our mortal existence. This is actually one of the best stories that he's ever told. Overall, a very decent setup but it does lay the groundwork for an episode that is nominally more engaging. Can you tell them that I just want a little time to myself? Met by the one in the hit. You have a dodge? They say fine, but not without them. So if you were paying attention, you probably noticed that the previous story took place over the course of two days, whereas this one condenses its main story into probably a few hours of the first day. I thought it was kind of clever the way they honed in on it, 
because there are other episodes like these that is generally telling one story from two different angles, but this is the only one that I've seen juggle with such a, a, an odd time frame. Honestly, I probably would have given this one props over the other one just for the song alone. It is a bop. Probably kind of underrated at this point. But in current year, I think the wider implications of Candace feeling more on home on Mars than she would back in Danville is a little, little interesting. It is a premise that could technically be repeated, but it's not one that could be topped. This one just has more of an eccentric energy behind it. It's pretty sharp-witted, it's fast on its feet, even though it is trying to take its time to tell you this story. It's a really interesting set, but this one kind of brings the whole thing up a notch. That pretty much does it for season one. There's 47 episodes in this batch. Our only job here on out is to rank them from worst to best. Now listen, any episodes that are at the, the bottom of these lists, most of the time, they're not really on my shit list or anything. A lot of the time, especially for this one, these are just kind of episodes that are that are totally fine but got bumped down by better ones. I think there's only one or two in the in the current run of the show that I would consider genuinely bad. But you'll know them when we get to them. Number 47, Crack That Whip. Number 46, Journey to the Center of Candace. Number 45, Swinter. Number 44, Comet Kermillion. Number 43, Flop Stars. Number 42, A Hard Day's Night. Number 41, Bolarama Drama. Number 40, Candace Loses Her Head. Number 39, I Robot. Number 38, The Best Lazy Day Ever. Number 37, The Magnificent Few. Number 36, Ready for the Bettys. Number 35, Jerk de Soleil. Number 34, Runaway Runway. Number 33, Mom's Birthday. Number 32, Does This Duck Bill Make Me Look Fat? No, no it doesn't. Number 31, Oil on Candace. Number 30, Get That Big Foot Out of My Face. Number 29, Got Game. Number 28, The Ballad of Bad Beard. Number 27, Out to Launch. Number 26, Boyfriend from 27,000 BC. No, I did not plan for that to happen. Number 25, Grease Lightning. Number 24, I Scream, You Scream. Number 23, Voyage to the Bottom of Buford. Number 22, Unfair Science Fair. Number 21, It's About Time. Number 20, Unfair Science Fair Redux, Another Story. Number 19, Tree to Get Ready. Number 18, Leave the Busting to Us. Number 17, The Flying Fishmonger. Number 16, Traffic Cam Caper. Number 15, Out of Tune. Number 14, Lawn Gnome Beach Party of Terror. Number 13, The Monster of Phineas and Ferbstein. Number 12, It's a Mud 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 World. Number 11, Phineas and Ferb Get Busted. Number 10, Toy to the World. Number 9, Hail Dufania. Number 8, Put That Putter Away. Number seven, lights, Candace, action. Number six, one good scare ought to do it. Number five, the fast and the Phineas. Number four, are you my mommy? Number three, raging bully. Number two, dude, we're getting the band back together. And the number one episode of Phineas and Ferb season one goes to roller coaster. Yeah, I know. Very, very predictable. I just felt like it was the most appropriate choice. That pretty much covers it. Season 2 coming probably within a week, but shorter videos coming before that. Make the most of it. Seize the day. And I'll see you... hopefully tomorrow.